months old. Um, but it's really cool to hear like what your path is. And so I think it'd be nice if we share like a little bit about our background, what our path is to where we're, what we're doing right now. And um, so what have you been trained in versus what have you done some self-study on? And so maybe we can just jump in and, and share a little bit about that. Let's start with, um, let's start with Jen. Okay. Um, so yeah, my background is uh, in, in art school. So I went to uh, sort of painting studio classes since I was pretty young. And then um, once I graduated high school, I knew I wanted to go to a, like a fine arts college. So I found a school in Baltimore um, that I really liked that had a pretty good arts program, but also a liberal arts program. Um, so I studied general fine arts there. So I did a lot of um, painting and sculpture and very kind of like traditional medium art forms. And towards the end of my studies there, I got a little bit more interested in video and also like performance and sculptural stuff. Um, but I think what I've, what I've always really been interested in is building stuff with other people. Um, and if you came to my talk earlier, you know that's kind of what I, where I ended up landing. Um, but I was always really intrigued by the idea of, um, of building stuff in some type of like community with others. And not to say I don't do stuff solo, I, I do build some of my own um, projects. But a lot of what I do is like um, collaborative and integrating with other people with other skill sets and a lot of like public kind of um, site specific pieces. Yeah, cool. And um, and Allie, I think you were I watched a bit of your talk earlier today. Um, how so how did you discover that you like to make things? How did you end up um, tinkering on projects and building things? Where, what was the beginning of that to you and how did you end up doing what you're doing now? Well, I guess one of my first experiences with engineering was when I was in kindergarten, I wanted to build a robot for the science fair. Cause you know, when you watch TV, you always see people building robots for the science fair as like the stereotypical project. So I was like, oh yeah, I'll do that. And my dad was like, oh, I don't know. You're only in kindergarten. You're only five years old. I don't know if you can build a robot so you can do something else. So I did something else that year, but then the next year, uh, way before the science fair even was announced, I was like, I want to build a robot for the science fair this year. And my dad was like, okay, whatever. He totally didn't believe me. So I went downstairs and I came up with the robot half done. He was like, oh, I guess you are building a robot for the science fair. So that's where I really started uh, making and building things. And uh, I ended up winning the science fair that year. And I just kept making more and more inventions and projects and uh, winning more and more competitions. And then I started speaking at schools and different events like Miami Maker Fair here, uh, different Maker Fairs around the country. And that's how I got into Mythbusters Junior, um, which was a really amazing experience for making and STEAM and uh, being just a good role model for kids. And so being able to immerse other people in the STEM experience. And that's what got me where I am today. That's super interesting. So like Jen's background kind of feels more like exploratory in like um, arts and learning different kinds of techniques and being ex uh, inspired by, by that kind of art world. And Ali, it sounds like you're more, you kind of started with a specific idea, like a specific thing. And in making that thing, you <laughs> learned how to be a maker. That, it's kind of interesting, like how, how that's different. Um, yeah. Stephanie, what about what about your background? Well, I mean, I think I have a little bit of a mix because growing up, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to be like a, a rock star or a movie star. So, <laughs> but that didn't happen. Um, <laughs> but it was well, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a self-proclaimed, I guess. <laughs> But um, so it wasn't until much, much, much later in college when I started, um, I had a lot more math classes and I realized that I really like math and also computer science and I like programming. So I got really passionate about that. I also did watch the Pixar documentary where I found out that the founders were all computer scientists and I was like, ah, that's what I want to do then. So that's kind of how I stumbled upon computer science and then engineering. So I think I can have, I still have a lot of the creative side, artsy side of me somewhere in here, but, um, and I use it for my projects a lot, I think. So, yeah. Cool. I totally identify with like all of your backgrounds. I, I feel like, like you said to Stephanie, like I, my background's kind of a mix. Like 
I did um, study art in school and I studied, I studied graphic design. So like I, I kind of along the same lines of Jen, like I, um, while I was studying in that art program, I, I was taking as many art electives as I could. And I was just trying to dabble in everything and learn different ways of making things. I didn't know the word maker, you know, like, like that wasn't a term when I was in college. So I just was taking things I was interested in. So I did photography and um, sculpture and drawing and, um, and design and ceramics and printmaking. Oh my gosh, love printmaking. And, but I didn't know any of that stuff was going to come back and be useful later, you know, cause I didn't, I thought I was going to graduate as a graphic designer and be a graphic designer. Um, and then I, I was a graphic designer and I missed all that other stuff, you know? So I kind of, and I didn't, I still didn't know the term maker until I went to a maker fair and at a maker fair I was like, wait a minute, these people do everything. You know, like all of it is valid. Like maybe, maybe I can do everything or maybe I don't have to, um, maybe I don't have to be limited by like the, the title on my business card, you know? So that was kind of like a huge eye opener for me. And then I just started like dabbling in things. Um, and I saw someone on TV putting electronics into fashion clothes like um, on Project Runway and I was like, what is that, you know? So um, I think I've just been open to, uh, I, I like to say I'm very impressionable and I just like, you know, try to sponge up like inspiration and ideas and just try to learn things. I love that you mentioned the maker fairs because I felt the exact same way. I felt like these are my people. I belong. <laughs> so yes, I, I, I agree with you. I didn't know, like, I didn't think I was the only one, but I, I knew there were people out there. I just didn't know where they were. And then the maker fairs is like where everybody comes together and I was like, yes. <laughs> totally. Yeah. I think there's something so powerful about like, I'll never forget the first maker fair I went to where I saw like, electronics right next to welding right next to fiber arts like all of it is like together it wasn't like separated you know like um it, it could all exist together and you could seamlessly go from learning one thing to learning something else and i just think that's so powerful yeah i also think the the distinction between artists and maker is is sort of interesting because i know like for me, there was definitely a kind of like an aha moment, say exactly the same as what you guys are talking about of like, I, I had not, I didn't know what the word maker, you know, what it meant or what it was. And also like went to my first maker fair and had the same like, oh, this is where my people are. And like, I came from art school. So I, I definitely had people there as well, but there's something different about the, the like art school, kind of like fine art mentality that feels very, um, almost like academic uh, and sort of rigorous and and the, the maker community feels a lot more, um, I don't want to say resourceful because artists are resourceful, but it's it's more like teach yourself. There's a lot more, um, there's a lot more of a sharing culture, I feel like among makers than there is necessarily among artists. Artists are sort of like protective of their own little corner. Uh, but I think that the maker community has this very sort of like mixed media, everyone's like hacking things together and teach like teach yourself DIY kind of stuff. Um, that's very different than the fine art community. And I felt really drawn to that um, and kind of like gravitated more towards that than my than my fine arts background. So I completely, Allie, oh, sorry. Yeah, oh, no, take it away. No, okay. Ahead. Yeah, I was gonna say I completely agree. And one of the things that I noticed about Maker Fairs is that uh, everybody is very friendly all the time. Like, I always make friends every time I go to a Maker Fair. Uh, when I first uh, went to my first Maker Fair, it was kind of a mind-blowing experience for me because uh, at home, you know, I would program with Arduino when it was first out, you know, uh, soldering projects and stuff. And I would go to school uh, in South Dakota where our, you know, computer class is about uh, Google Drive and nobody knew what I was talking about at all. But being able to come to Maker Fair and learn about all these new technologies and new people and, you know, uh, ask for help even with some projects and stuff like that and being able to, you know, uh, draw information from them and learn from them and their projects. It was really neat. 
That's awesome. And now um, I was going to just ask you, like, uh, so for me growing up, I didn't have um, tutorials on the internet, you know, to learn from or even to contribute back to. And um, I am jealous of people who get to grow up now with all of that stuff available. And I was just curious, like, um, the question I have written down here about, like, training, what are you trained in versus self-study? And um, for you, uh, I'm, I am curious, like, what, how much of what you're doing um, is self-study and things that you're learning from tutorials on the internet um, versus, like, what you're learning in school, which is what I would consider, like, you know, your training? Well, for me personally, uh, through school, I learned a little bit about 3D design. Uh, we did a little bit with, you know, Autodesk Inventor and stuff like that. And I used that in some of my uh, projects. And we also learned, you know, the small amount of programming, like block programming through scratch and stuff. Uh, but mostly that was just introductory courses that really only scratched the surface of what you can do with those kinds of technologies. So whenever I got home after learning that sort of thing, then I would just delve deep into those projects and learn a lot about what I could and what I could use for my projects that I want to do and how I could implement other technologies into doing it. And so um, I feel like a lot of the stuff that I learned in school was only just scratching the surface of what is really out there to learn. That's cool. And then I see that you take that and you create, like you're feeding back into that world. So you're making your own tutorials and informational videos and sharing your projects. And um, like to your point about, you know, kids doing things now that are just important as, you know, what you're going to do in the future. I think that's so cool that you, you are totally part of that maker culture of learning from things that you see in the community and then like feeding right back into it and putting that information, like new information back into it. Yeah. And I feel that that really, um, feeds back into kind of Jen's projects with open source and, you know, being able to collaborate with other people because uh, it's really easy to find people that are willing and open to do projects with you online these days. And uh, now that there's more communication than ever, there's really a lot more projects to be done that can, you know, could never be done before because there wasn't this much communication. So it's really cool being able to see what we can accomplish these days. For sure. Um, and I, I like that you bring up the technology that's available now and what we can do with it. Cause I feel like actually all of us kind of have that, um, have that sort of integral into our work in different ways. Um, so like for me, it's a big inspiration. Technology is a big inspiration. It also empowers me to do things that I, I couldn't otherwise do unless I had these, these special tools or had um, internet connectivity. And um, so I think that's a good way to move into our next sort of topic, which is inspiration. Um, and so I think it'd be cool if we could share about like what inspires us. And um, I think with the, the technology component in that, um, for me, it's that I, I am inspired by a lot of futuristic ideas and technology that doesn't exist yet. And I sort of dream about it, but um, I'm also really inspired by emerging technology and innovating uh, technology that is being innovated on today. Um, we have a lot access to these tools that couldn't be, um, that I couldn't have in my home before, like a tabletop CNC machine, a small desktop CNC, or a laser cutter in my garage, or obviously 3D printing is just like, it's an amazing technology that we can actually have in our home workshops. Um, so that's a huge inspiration for me, but I'm curious to hear from you how, um, how, what your general inspiration, what generally inspires you and also um, how you are working technology into your builds, either as something that is a driving force or as a process thing. Mm, I guess I could go. <laughs> I don't know. I'm thinking though, I'm not sure exactly what inspires me because I think every, every project I take on is more of a, like a challenge, like, Ooh, I bet I can do that. And then it's like, every time I fail, I'm like, no, I know I can do this. I know I can do this. So it's more of, um, 
it's more of like a goal of like seeing that end result at the end, like I did this. Um, but I guess that could be like an inspiration. I'm not sure if that's the same force. <laughs> but um, as far as technology, I think I use it a little different. I think with my background being like, oh, that's what I learned. Like, like literally, I was more like, well, it's more of like, now I want to play with woodworking and I don't know anything about woodworking. So what if I make a thing that then I'll program something for it. But right now I'm really, really interested in the woodworking part. And then like, I'll figure out the electronics later, kind of like an afterthought. So I think for me, yeah, the inspiration is like, let's see if I can figure this new technique out. Now I'm into woodworking. Maybe next time I'm going to try CNCing, you know, like, I don't know. <laughs> so I guess so you get your tool. idea and then you're like, you're like, I have this idea for something I want to make and now I'm going to figure out all the things I need to do to make it. Exactly. Like I didn't know, I didn't have a 3D printer and I didn't know how to 3D print before I did my Daft Punk helmet. And I knew I wanted to do a Daft Punk helmet and I didn't know how I was going to do it. I just knew I wanted a Daft Punk helmet. So I figured out how to, I figured out about 3D printing and I figured out how to 3D print and I got a 3D printer and then I, I, I it was hard because the printer is not just like that, right? So, and then I learned about Bondo and how it's used for cars, but then you can use it for 3D prints. So it looks really nice and smooth. I learned how to spray paint. And then like the electronics was literally the last thing I did. The lights and programming. <laughs> it was like, oh yeah, it has lights. But the whole month was literally just for the helmet, like fabricating the helmet. So kind of like that. Yeah. I totally identify with that because I, I, I've had very similar um, uh, processes when I'm making something. Like I think, oh, I want to make this thing that has all this electronics in it. But actually 80% of my time is spent learning all the other stuff I have to do to get to the point where I'm putting the electronics in it. So I totally, totally identify. Yeah. Jen? Um, yeah, it's interesting. As, as you were both talking, I was kind of reflecting on the fact that I have a very different relationship with technology, I think, than, than the rest of you. Um, I wouldn't say I'm like against, I mean, I'm definitely not against technology, obviously, but I think I, a lot of my work is driven more from an aesthetic perspective. So like my inspiration is a lot of, it's a lot of imagery. It's like, um, you know, textures of fabric or screenshots from like an old film or something like it's very aesthetically driven. Um, and then in terms of like actually building stuff, I tend to gravitate more towards sort of like physical, tangible mediums and processes than, than technological stuff. So like I've gotten pretty proficient with the laser cutter. Like I feel I can, I can do a lot of stuff with a laser cutter, but I often find myself getting really frustrated when I'm trying to troubleshoot something with a 3D printer or a CNC machine because it's there's that extra layer of like, I know there's like a logic and a system behind the surface, you know, with the, with all the code. Um, but it's so much easier for me to troubleshoot something that's mechanical or physical, that's tangible in space. So like I can learn all the properties of a particular species of wood and like really learn how to work with that material. And I can like see it and I can feel it and I can, I can troubleshoot like what's physically in front of me. Whereas like sometimes if like, if the 3d printer is acting up, I'm like, what is wrong with you? What do you need? What do you want? Like, I can't, uh, it's, it's like another layer for me. Um, so I think, yeah, I think that my, my background and my sort of design inclinations lend themselves a lot more towards those more tactile, um, mediums. And so, yeah, I do a lot of, I do a lot of woodworking. I do a lot of like paint and sculptural stuff. I'm starting to dabble in metalwork. Um, and I do a lot of like 2D, you know, kind of design graphic type of things and, and sketching and stuff like that. So technology is sort of, it's a new frontier for me that I'm like getting to learn more about. Yeah. Um, I love when you, um, when I see you just like bust something out on the jigsaw and it's like super, like super intricate turns and curves. And I'm like, oh, I need to practice my jigsawing. And sometimes I would rather just like get the jigsaw out and just cut out the shape that I want instead of having to go through that filter of like designing it in Illustrator or whatever, and then like figuring it out on my laser cutter and all the limitations of that. Um, I, 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 
Yeah. When I see, I, I think it was something specific that you posted on your social was like you jigsawing something. And I was like, Ooh, that makes me want to use my jigsaw. Oh, the little scroll saw, like the little curly. Cube. Oh yeah. Maybe it was the scroll saw. Yeah. 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 And I love that stuff. Cause you can, you can like see and feel your improvement. Like you get this like very physical, like, like relationship with the tool and you can like, I don't know. It's just like, I, I gravitate so much more towards those physical processes than, than like, honing in you know my settings on a 3d printer or something like i'd rather i'd rather manipulate the wood and like get those those hand skills yeah i totally i totally hear you ali what inspires you and um where do you get your ideas and how big of a factor is technology in that for you maybe it's a lot maybe it's nothing <laughs> well i feel like uh for me what inspires me is just everyday problems like i'll come across I come across problems all the time. I don't feel like I'm a complaining person, but at the same time, if something annoys me, then I'm going to try to fix it. So I feel like that's where most of my projects come from is like, uh, let, like for the frost stoppers, it was, oh, I got frostbite on my finger. This is the worst. I'm going to build something to actually make it so that I can go outside again without worrying about frostbite. So uh, even if it's not a problem that, you know, everybody in the world has, uh, it's, it's something that annoys me. So being able to make uh, an invention that can solve that problem and at least prove my, improve my daily life is uh, one of the reasons why I really like making. Um, it just really depends on the project, I guess, of what kind of technologies I use in it. Uh, I really like to learn about different technologies in any way that I can. So in many of my projects, then I'll just, you know, see what works and what doesn't and try to include as many different, you know, kind of mediums as I can, uh, just so I can learn as much as I can throughout the process. But sometimes, you know, the simpler the idea, the better. So being able to come up with simple solutions is not always a bad thing. Yeah, wise words. Um, I, I find myself overcomplicating a lot. And I think, I think when I get to like 75 to 85% done in my project, that's when I can s suddenly see all the ways that I've overcomplicated it. And I'm like, it's like, at that point, I need to be ready to like, cut fat, you know, like let some things go that I just maybe was really uh, attached to for some personal reasons. And, you know, maybe I just love the color purple, but it's just not working and I just have to let it go. And it's like the hardest part. Um, but I think it's cool that you're, you're often inspired by a specific problem that you want to solve or um, like you're inspired and motivated by something that you see that you could make better um that's super inspiring to me i make a lot of things that are like i dream about this or wouldn't it be cool to have this thing but um i love that you're you know you're focused on like here and now and what's right in front of you and you're making things that are improving things you know this world now that's super cool i have to ask you though because i know when we talked in our in our um in our video earlier we were diving a little deeper into our own personal projects um when you were talking about your three ring binder i think i didn't quite understand what you meant by a three ring binder because for me a three ring binder you were talking about it as like a something that you wear the backpack no right? yeah okay yeah. so at our school uh backpacks weren't allowed i don't know why but you weren't allowed to bring a backpack to school so instead what they sold were these really big like basically like those file holders you know like the you know that have the little clips that you can put the papers in with the holes in them and then you just put all of your files in there and then you just bring that to school instead and they make them really big and like out of fabric sometimes just because they basically designed them as a backpack, but way more uncomfortable, which is really annoying to me. So I decided that it's like a briefcase. Okay, what it is, it's like a briefcase, but like for children. Yeah. And it's like <laughs> less like it. so it doesn't even look good. And it really annoyed me. And so it was heavy and uncomfortable and not very practical. And so I just wanted to make it either a briefcase or a backpack. And I went with backpack. So yeah, that's how it goes. <laughs> That's cool. People can see pictures of that in like the pre-recorded like intro that we did um, when we talk about each of our projects. That's in that video. So if you want to see yes. what Ali, yeah, about. yeah. Um, so that kind of brings me into the next sort of topic, which is our creative process. Um, 
so when you go through a project like that, so you, you have your idea, you have your inspiration, you kind of know what you want to make. Um, what are your processes for working that idea out into, um, into a project? Like, uh, do you prototype? Do you do a lot of sketching or do you just wing it? Um, I myself, I, I talk about my process, but I definitely have a lot of different approaches to things depending on, depending on each project. Sometimes I'll do a lot of sketching or sometimes I'll just have it so figured out in my head, I just jump in and usually that's when things go kind of off the rails for me. Um, I have to have discipline to, to do the sketching and prototyping work up front. And when I do, things turn out better. Um, but I'm curious how much sketching and prototyping and um, like brainstorming and stuff you all go through when you're working on your projects. Mm, well, I do a lot, a lot of drawings and sketches. Like I have to be able to see the project in a drawing. And if that is complete, like I can see it in my head in 3D almost. And I'm like, okay, I can start on it. So I make the big picture drawing, then like I need to pick up, okay, let's zoom in into this part, zoom in into, so I do all the different drawings and then I can begin. Um, as far as prototyping, the only prototypes I do are when on a breadboard with the electronics, but I mean, it's usually like, oh, it works, solder. Oh, it works. It's not like this fully prototype thing done. And no, it's, it's pretty quick process. I try to be quick with those. Yeah, that's it. What about you, Jen? Um, I'm also really attached to my sketchbook. So in a similar vein, like I almost, I can't fully conceive of a thing until I've sketched it out. Like, and, and the drawings are very spatial and they're very like lots of notes and measurements and stuff like that. So my kind of like extension of my brain that happens in my sketchbook and it's just like pencil and paper, super analog. Um, and then I do, I do like to build a lot of um, physical prototypes first, whether it's like a miniature version or like a lot of times I'll, um, I'll cut stuff out of foam core or cardboard just to like test out shapes and patterns and stuff. And I actually, I really enjoy the, the prototypes themselves, like the really rough, it's almost like a Tom Sachs kind of aesthetic of those. So I save all of them. Like I don't throw any of my, I have like all of my little foam core models and all my little cardboard shapes in like an archive because I just love going back and, and then seeing like the original and then the finished product and like the, the process between them. But I, yeah, I think it's like a really cool little like scrapbook of your, of your thought process. I feel like I'm different from all of you guys because I uh, don't have a lot of patience and I'm not great at drawing. So I usually just jump right in. Um, I will often think of an idea that I want to do and then I'll research it a little bit, see what others have done in the past and see what kind of, you know, um, materials I'll need for it and stuff. And then as soon as I can, I'll just start working. Like I won't even have a complete idea of what it'll look like when it's done. But I feel like I just have to trust the process and trust that I'm doing the right thing most of the time. And hopefully it turns out well in the end. So I feel like my process is a little bit more chaotic. And uh, I'll do sketches, but mostly when uh, explaining what I want to do uh, to other people, just so that I can, you know, uh, be able to say I need this much wood and this much, you know, material and stuff like that and how it's going to go together. But mostly I just do whatever. And then if I'm in the middle of a project uh, and I get stuck or something, then I usually take a break. And it, this usually gets really chaotic even more because uh, my breaks consist of more projects. So then my yeah. whole house is covered in projects at once yeah. and it just gets really messy really fast. So um, I usually make a huge mess and then just consolidate it to one room and then it stays there for a while until I finish it. And uh, so, yeah, there's always a mess in our house somewhere because of me um, trying to make things pretty quickly. But uh, in the end, uh, most everything turns out good. So it seems to be working. So, Allie, I used to be exactly like that, exactly like, just go for it, ah. <laughs> but <laughs> I mean, it's a good thing, I'm not saying, but I was like, um, when I started trying to make videos about them, it's so hard because then you have eight hours straight of footage that you don't yeah. even know what to do with, so that's why I had to start drawing out my, like, the 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 process kind of of like the product and to be like oh now I know like the steps that at least I want to get on film and not film myself or 
10 hours straight, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, it's more of a, I had to adjust myself a little bit because of videos. Exactly. I feel like I'm the same way. And I'll often take pictures of what I'm doing. Like, even if I don't know completely what I'm doing, I'll just feel like, oh, this might be important. Click, you know? Yeah. And so I can add into a video later if I need to. But even then, there's often missing footage and stuff that I'll just have to try to fill in. But yeah, I'll, I'll have to develop my process as <laughs> I go along. <laughs> yeah. What about you, Sophie? Oh, sorry. Um, no, no, I, I do, um, I do a lot of research before I start every project. So I hit the internet and I find things that other people have done that are similar, or I see, um, I, I, uh, go to like, um, books and movies that inspire me and I get the, I get, I like to take the photos and I, um, I actually print them out, I copy them, and I cut them out, and I stick them in my notebooks, and I end up um, creating notebooks about my projects, and sometimes it's helpful for me because I, uh, it kind of like tricks me into starting my project. Um, I might, I might need a little bit of like, uh, uh, I might need a little boost to get going in my project, so um, it doesn't necessarily feel like work to scour the internet for images and ideas. So um, it's kind of a helpful way for me to get going. And then um, I take those those images and sometimes I don't do, so I never thought I was good at drawing. Um, I, I still don't think I'm very good at drawing, but I, I use it as a tool. And sometimes um, an easy way for me to get beyond my um, my low drawing self-esteem is for me to take an image that already exists and draw my idea on top of it. So I do that a lot. Um, I trace a lot and then I draw on what I would do differently, like right on that, right on that image. And you do that for my own work too. So kind of throughout my process, I might take photos of the, um, of my work in progress and then print that photo out and draw right on top of it, like the thing I want to do next, or I might test out a color scheme on it. I have this thing I've been doing where I love office supplies too. So I have the, a lot of those plastic sheets, you know, uh, plastic like sleeves you can put a page in. So I'll print out my photo and I'll throw it in there and then I'll take my colored pens and I'll test like different color schemes on different plastic sleeves. So I can like slide it out, you know, and like oh. maybe I'll try blue on here, maybe try blue on there. Like I know I could do that. I'm a graphic designer. I know I could do that on my computer um, pretty easily in Photoshop. But to Jen's point, um, sometimes I'd rather stay offline for that. Like I'd rather um, use my hands and just keep my brain, you know, here in the physical world instead of going online all the time or or just looking at a screen. So. Um, that's like the, the way that I sketch. And then I do a lot of prototyping also, but the prototypes um, sometimes are so uh, scrappy. Like it's just, uh, I might print my, the first layer of my print out. Sometimes that's what I do to, to check alignment when I do a 3D print mm -hmm. is I'll just print the first layer and pull it off. And that gives me like the footprint of the, of the, the thing I want to print without going through the four hours of printing the whole thing. And it can check holes and stuff like that. Um, and then sometimes it's just like printing something out on my inkjet printer and cutting it out and pasting it together and just seeing if it'll fit. It's a lot of fit prototyping for my wearable work. That's really smart. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I tried, uh, I, I've done a lot of things in the past where I was like, huh, after I printed that eight hour print, I'm like, I actually only needed the first layer. You know, I, I learned these things the hard way. And then I try to keep my, I try to keep it all by writing it down. So I write everything down because I can't keep it all in my brain. There's just no way. So maybe um, we're at 140. So maybe we should see if there are any questions? Maybe um, let me take a look at the. Are there questions in the chat? I can I can ask some questions that come in, which is uh, oh, great from the voice above. Um, <laughs> 
what's, what are some of the inspirations that you've, you look at when things that happen with COVID now? Like, is there anything that has inspired you, any, uh, any makers or anything that inspired you to be the COVID during this pandemic? Well, I think it's really cool what people have been able to do uh, just with the things in their homes. Uh, that's one of the things that I found out uh, while doing the uh, Stay and Plan project, uh, which was um, a social media video series uh, that had daily uh, how-tos on projects that you can do with things around your house, uh, just to keep people entertained and keep their minds working while they're stuck at home. And uh, it was insane how many projects people were able to come up with just with the daily household items. And uh, it was really inspiring to be able to see people sharing those ideas and enjoying them, uh, even in the midst of such uncertainty. Yeah, and also to add to that, I love seeing your projects and how you can be creative. But then also like, so I was blocked. I couldn't get inspiration at all. I was at first, I was like, oh my gosh. But then I was inspired a lot by the, 3D printing community when they started printing the, the face shields. And I was like, that is so good. I'm going to, I'm going to help out. I have a 3D printer, so I cannot come up with projects by myself right now because I just didn't have the mind space, but I can, I can physically help by making face shields and sending them out. So I was actually really inspired by other makers that then I could also contribute to in a way. So that too, I wanted to add to also that. <laughs> Yeah, shout out to Prusa and uh, Joel Telling, and yeah. <laughs> Matter hacker. Yeah, I was I was really inspired by that too. I loved seeing everybody like figuring out what they could do to help, mm -hmm. and it felt it felt amazing to be a part of that you know initiative. Um, and uh, I I also as Stephanie felt like really overwhelmed and blocked. Like I was like I don't even suddenly all of my projects didn't seem to like matter. You know, yeah. like I, I was just like, wow, what, like why, why is it important for me to finish this costume right now? You know, um, so I got, I got, a, I, I wouldn't say like not distracted. I got like hyper focused on it. You know, it was like I couldn't look away. Um, but printing the face shields, like really, it was almost like therapy. Like it felt like, wow, I, I could actually do something useful that's helping, and then. Um, while my printer was going, you know, I could work on my own stuff and kind of compartmentalize a little bit. So that was helpful to me. And then I got an idea while I was doing the face shields of um, how I could laser cut a, a top portion. I saw it was so good. Um, Sorry, keep going. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, and, um, there were a lot of different cool designs of face shields. I th think they're all great. And um, the one that I really liked printing was the 3D Workstown one because it was so fast to print. It's such an elegant design. I think from a design perspective, it was brilliant. Um, yeah. And I saw some other um, face shields coming out that had more coverage over the top. And I just thought there was this opportunity to use those, the pegs that were already designed in um, the 3D Berkstan model to just add a little cover over the top. So I just designed a, a, a laser cut, laser cuttable file that you could throw on your printer or on your Cricut or even cut up by hand and just add that little bit more coverage at the top for, you know, any droplets coming in from up there. So I didn't expect to get inspired by that because I also felt like, Oh, I'm just turning my brain off, you know, but um, I had that idea. So I was like, I'm going to throw it out there. That's great. Yeah. Here's another question for all of you. I guess this will probably be the last question because we're doing pretty good on time. Hey, I think video design is so important for maker projects. And this panel is especially good at creating visually successful design. How can you promote aesthetic design that are pleasing in projects and maker movement? Jen, <laughs> hey, can you can you say the very last part again? Yes. Yeah, so sorry. How can you promote aesthetically pleasing projects in the maker movement? How can I simplified you, it. Okay. How can you promote aesthetically pleasing projects in the maker movement? Um. Oh wow, that's a, that's quite a follow up after the like you know <laughs> the world print PPE like what can we do? <laughs> <laughs> um. I don't know. Uh, I mean, I, I think, I don't know. I think that, that all design is ultimately sort of like derivative of other things. And so to me, like the most, the most 
the strongest designs that I see have been sort of like inspired by and informed and synthesized lots of other things. So it's not just like a ripoff of somebody else's design. It's like this, these were very informed design decisions. So like, mm -hmm. and it's not like you have to have formal training, but I think that people that are like really succeeding at, at strong design in anything, whether it's your, you know, the setup of your shop or your, your logo or the, you know, a thing that you're building, um, it comes from having like in w the ways that we all do, like researching, understanding what's out there and what's been done, seeing what visually works, um, and then kind of drawing bits and pieces from that to synthesize something that's that's unique and that that's yours, but is also um, yeah, it's just like aesthetically informed by other things that you've that you've absorbed. Um, I don't I don't know if that's quite the answer to, to the question that that was asked, but I don't know. Does anyone else have a take on that? I well, um, oh, sorry, you go, go first. You go first. Go oh, okay. Um, I think um, design often, uh, often people think of design as being visual design, and it's definitely a visual is a component of design. But um, for me, design is a framework that you can apply to your entire project and every part of your project. And I think the reason um, people think that uh, maybe, I, I hear a lot of people talk to me about their projects and they're like, oh, you know, it doesn't look so good or it, it looks so um, unfinished or, or whatever. And I think, I think it's just that they are not realizing that they made some visual choices on their project. And um, so for me, I want to kind of highlight that in the maker community and just bring a focus to design and, and visual design because I think it's a missed opportunity for, for people a lot of the time. And I think if you just realize that you are making a visual choice about your project, then you can make a different choice. Um, and it could be, it's not necessarily about making your project pretty or you know look like um, a, a consumer product, it might be something like if you have two buttons on your on your panel and one of them is red and one of them is green, I instantly understand that those buttons have a relationship and I, I can make a guess about what they do versus if you have two white buttons or two gray buttons, you're going to have to tell me what those buttons do and how your project works. So I think spending a little bit of time on the visual of your project is just an opportunity to let your project kind of speak for itself. And it's kind of more, it's more powerful than people realize as, as an integral part of making, not just um, the making it look beautiful, which I, I appreciate as well. I think aesthetic is important, but um, it does more than just uh, make your project appealing. I love that so much, Sophie. That's like, oh, that's such a good <laughs> perspective on it. <laughs> I'm just like, Thanks. I've been thinking about it a lot lately. So I'm like, why do I make such a big deal about how my projects look? <laughs> yeah, you I, I guess last question. Oh, sorry. go ahead. Sorry. I guess last question. No, you can ask Last question for all of you. Um, and this is something that we, we, we talked about pre uh, turning on the webinar on. Uh, everybody asks, um, how much time do you spend organizing your space after a project? Like, how do you keep your space kind of clean after projects? I only clean it when I have to start working on another project. It's kind of like when I'm done with a project, I'm like, I'm done. And then next time I'm like, oh, I really want to work on this thing, but everything is a mess. So I need to clean. So I clean before a new project, not right after my latest project, if that makes sense. <laughs> what about you guys? I kind of do the same. I, uh, at the end of the day working, I just kind of like walk away. And then like, I, I kind of um, have started to build into my routine that when I walk in the next day, I do like 15 minutes of tidying so I can actually like work. But um, the only way that happens is that I've kind of assigned homes to everything so that I can clean up in 15 minutes. Um, like if everything has a place to go back to, then it's easy for me to do the cleaning. And I really just get into trouble when I, when I collect too much stuff or I have too much material or honestly like too many machines. I don't have any place to put. Um, that's, it's like just constantly fighting the entropy 
is how I think about it. It's just like always trying to make itself messy and I just have to fight it back every day. <laughs> Allie, tell us what about you? What about you? <laughs> Well, I feel like for me, uh, if I'm in the middle of, you know, a project, it's not going to get cleaned. Like, it's going to be a mess for a long time. And that's why I usually do projects in my unfinished basement, because then nobody has to deal with it. But um, if I'm at the end of a project, then I feel like it's kind of, you know, a closing ceremony. It's like, yeah, I finally did it. It's time to clean up. And yeah, and I'm also a stress cleaner. So like, if I'm stressed out, then I'll just clean the entire house and just pick up my room. I probably pick up my room like once a day. It doesn't even have time to get dirty, but I still pick it up. And so I feel like in general, if I'm just like around the house or whatever, then yeah, I'll clean things all the time. But if I'm in the middle of a project, it kind of, everything has to be there and it has to be in the middle of my waist that I kind of force myself to actually get back into it if I'm stuck. Um, just because it's bothering me by being there. So um, I feel like that's one of the ways why I stay on task while I'm making a project. What about yeah. you, Jen? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I was gonna say cleaning yeah. is like the number one procrastination tool. Like if I need to be doing something else or I'm really stuck or just in a, you know, kind of like writer's block, I'm like, oh, I'll just reorganize this whole drawer that I don't <laughs> need to do right now. But suddenly now my drawer is organized. Um, my friend calls that um, procrastic cleaning. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what I do. <laughs> I have the unique challenge of being in a loft. So we don't have any, there's no walls at all. It's just one big open space. So I don't get any separation from the mess. So like I'm the same way as all of you, but like I have to live in it and look at it all the time. I so I, I am trying to create more homes and like systems of organization for things so that at least there's, um, yeah, there's like a, a place for everything to go back to because right now it's a little bit of like, like this, this little rectangle is organized, but like beyond, beyond the, you know. <laughs> and now that you mention it, actually, well, I finally have a workspace, but before this, I was living in an apartment and I always used to make in my kitchen. And then in the loft apartment, it was literally in like right across from my kitchen. Ali, you saw it. You went to my place that time. So it was like my living room slash workshop slash kitchen area. So I know exactly where you're coming from, Jen, when I was like, well, at least I know the workshop side is there and it's kind of tidy, kind of, but I won't look at it. I'm in the kitchen right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. I know what you mean. Well, that's all the time we have. Again, I thank all of you for coming. Uh, I am, again, humbled by you guys saying yes to me when I, when I call you guys to be in these things. Hopefully, we will see each other in person next year in Miami so you guys can enjoy the culture, the food, uh, and the company again of each other. Um, that's it for us. Thank you for watching. Um, these videos will be posted later today. Thank you, guys. Thank, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank, thank you, everyone. Yeah.